You are listening to a Pod Bros exclusive. Hi, boys and girls, we're live, brand new episode, Take Team Outdoor Podcast, and as always, I'm excited to do another show, and I'm excited to have this guy back on the show, uh, Anthony Dixon, Mr. Spot and Stalk himself. What's up? <laughs> not, not much. I left the introduction. Thank you. Um, I am enjoying the heat out here in Salt Lake City, man. It's just, uh, it's ramping up. It's We're, you know, going into the 99s and going into the double digits next week. And so I've got to, I've got to move earlier in the field and move later and try to stay out of that, uh, that heat, you know, at those higher elevations at that time of day. It definitely, it's definitely hot here as well. And yeah, uh, I I feel you. Like, I hate that. I'm just not a hot weather person, so I, I don't like it personally. But uh, I can't imagine being out west where it's even a touch warmer. Yeah, we we have very few mosquitoes this year, which is makes it more tolerable. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we live in the high alpine desert, you know. That's just, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Before uh, we get too crazy, I wanted to, just say uh, sorry to all the listeners last week. I don't know what it was, but I had some extremely bad feedback on my audio for last week's show. Even though Mark Clifford from Premier Outfitters, his audio was absolutely perfect, and that's what counts is what he says. But uh, I just wanted to apologize to everybody. I couldn't figure out what was wrong, so I sounded kind of shaky, and uh, this week that won't happen. But anyways, Dixon, um, I know you were just at, uh, you know, the Total Archery Challenge, which was super yep. cool, and uh, you you were, like, swagged out head to toe, and I'm a huge Sunglass fan, so uh, what kind mm. of shades are you running? Because those are sweet. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to start the process of working with Oakley, which uh, is taking a couple years, and... Uh, I run numerous pairs. Um, when I'm in the field, um, I run their their uh, sand tone, the the brown, if you'd like to call it that, for uh, lack of better terms. And then I run all the gamma on lenses. Um, the one in the article um, in Bow Hunting World, those are a, a brand new pair uh, that were unreleased uh, with their new lens, a prism lens. Those lenses are pretty cool, dude. They allow, uh, in the fall time is when I was using them, so some of the colors that were still uh, around, the greens and the oranges and yellows, were enhanced, which it took the browns and the best I could say is they kind of, um, make the browns stick out, which at that time of year, you know, looking for animals, was it a little bit easier? Yeah, and I was in a ground blind. Um, and they do the same in the in the other part of the season, which would be the early, and they're pretty cool. I think you should check them out because I know you're into gear. I know. Uh, you know, when new things come out, you're, you're on it. Just like you're asking me these questions now. <laughs> no, I totally am. And it's very, uh, just something from childhood. I was sadly born with a, a cataract in my left eye. So I've had it my whole life. So huh. at, absolutely, uh, I'm very sensitive to light. So I have been a sunglass gearhead since I was little. And, uh, so I just noticed stuff like that. So I wanted your take on exactly kind of what you just said on those lenses. You know, you change them yourself. You pop them in and out. And have you noticed? Because I know you wear them kind of like I do, gearing hunting. So do you mm-hmm. have you just noticed like some of that, you know, polarized lens has, has helped or, you know, part of the game plan for you spotting some of the, the animals you see or, or 
or just being able to be a little more comfortable without being glared upon? I think, well, two things there. One, if, you know, back up a little bit on glare. Glare is if, if you're sensitive, like your eyes um, are that you're saying, you know, polarized is going to be the best for that. Um, I don't have that that um, happening with my eyes, so I wouldn't um, know, but I would definitely check that out. Um, Non-polarized are a little bit more affordable. Um, Oakley's um, are rarely on sale, and I personally like the way they shape their lenses. Most companies will shape a lens or they'll they'll have a piece of, of glass and it's in the flat state, meaning it's flat. You could set it on a table and then they bend it with heat later. Well, Oakley doesn't do that. So they kind of build it the way your eye is. So as the light comes into your eye and reflects back in and out, that's how they build their lenses. That's their their magic recipe, I would say. But my favorite thing to do is, like, I'll go to the mall, which I don't go very often, um, and I will go to a sunglass shop. And I just try on, uh, even with Oakley, I'll try on a bunch of different frames to make sure I get the fit that I want. Uh, but then I also will try out different lenses. I don't, when I'm like hanging out with my kids and I'm going somewhere to say like a, a soccer game, I'll run like a mirrored lens uh, in a polarized. But if I'm going to like an evening event, and I have a, I have tons of shades. They, they take really good care of me, and I'll switch up. So I kind of get the option to choose. But what I'm saying to you guys that don't get that option is, you know, go to a mall, go to a sun, sunglass hut and, and check them out. And then, you know, they'll, they'll, I'll run a, a clear pair at night when I'm coming out. And um, that is probably – I found that to be – I don't know, like in your situation, like you guys are sat in tree stands and stuff like that, like wearing a pair of clear protective lenses are killer. I got tagged last week, sat in some stands, and I didn't have them on. And so I went to cut a branch, and my buddy was with me, and he was going to cut it at the same time. So when I dove in with the nippers, he dove in with his. And we were trying to, you know, we were cutting a small trail on the way out. And uh, that branch came back and hit me in the eye. And, um, and, and the, the, the bitch of it was, is I had, uh, my Oakley's in my pack and, um, I was bummed <laughs> to say the least. So yeah, that is, I guess, uh, you know, from a I'm protective right standpoint, you know, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Right with you. I was just going to say that multiple times, like you mentioned, especially for me and my situation or me and my hunting partner, Scotty, we're always hanging stands or even when you're helping, you know, like I'll hoist one up and he'll knock some tree bark. And numerous times, just for a second, I'll take the glasses off and one speck of tree bark will get in my eye. And then it could be hours, you know, but you're ruined for a few minutes. You're just not able to do anything. So it's so important I mean, that's on the small end, but like you're saying, I mean, you could get hit in the eye with a saw or God knows a tree, a whole tree branch, you know, who knows? It could be bad. Right. Yeah, I, I just, you know, especially if you're with a buddy and you're going through, you know, putting in a stand and stuff like that, um, I always look up, you know, because he'll be whispering to you like, hey, I need the saw or I need this. And a lot of times we'll already have the rope set up, so we're hauling um, different types of gear up and down setting those, you know. Um, but Oakley does for like someone that is more trying to get more out of their sunglasses. I've got a pair of um, Tom Stones and it's it's T-O-M-B-S-T-O-N-E and, and they're by Oakley and they have three different lenses with arms that are interchangeable. So you can have, you know, you could spend the money and buy one pair of shades instead of three or four that work for all purpose. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so you basically you, you can buy one frame and interchange those lenses for that style of frame. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This particular model just has the arms that come back to your ears. Uh, really cool setup how Oakley's got it set is you can disengage by pressing these levers and change the the uh, the lens is part of the frame, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that is pretty wild. That's a good, especially for us outdoors guys, that, that's a sweet, sweet ass hat idea for a yeah. shade. Yeah, they, and, and I get from, uh, like if you guys want to look, look on the tactical side of Oakley and you can get the the uh, the sand brown color or coyote brown. Um, those are probably my favorite. And those are, I don't have a pair with me. I'm looking around in the office right now and I don't have them. They must must be out my backpack but anyway those are probably my favorite and um i don't know they just do a really good job and and you know i've got to take better care of my eyes anyway so i like running uh i like running them i've been very happy no that's cool and that's why i wanted to bring it up is eye safety is important to me because my situation and and uh only having one perfect eye it means a lot to me, so I just wanted to see what you were doing and if there was a reason behind having the shades on so much. But I like the idea, so uh, kudos to that and kudos to Oakley for running uh, such good products. Yeah, thank you. So tell me about uh, Total Archery Challenge. I know you were there and going way back in history, Anthony was the man behind the original bowcast at the Bird, which is now the Total Archery Challenge, but I know you were there, Anthony. I know you ran into some guys, and and you shot, and it looks like you had a great time. I did. You know, they had uh, a great event. It's um, it's a long uh, – I think there was three courses up high, and they're very long. You know, these guys are shooting three to six hours. And they can – the courses can get backed up a little bit. That's usually the, the number one uh, – concern when people are going to 3d shoots but this is the big one for total archery is is snowbird it's their grand finale and um it's it's just a cool event you know i i don't know how many people were there this year i want to say around the 1500 mark and i don't know i just had a good time you know i really did i got to see a lot of old friends sit and talk and enjoy it and in the years past i never got to do that um, you know, when you're an event coordinator, uh, which I never set out to be, um, your your life is pretty stressful for three days. Well, yeah, yeah, you don't get to enjoy it whatsoever. No, so, <laughs> no. So. There's a pain in the it's a pain in the ass. I mean, when you know, I would always count down on Sunday. We always had it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday back in the day when I ran it, and uh, Sunday I would just count down the, the the hours and then the minutes down to the end you know because you never first off you never want anyone to get hurt um i.e meaning shot and we never did and then you don't really want people to get hurt and i would set some pretty um and the word lends itself uh to what i did was extreme courses i, I never made it for the event to make money i made it so people and myself would be challenged beyond their wildest dreams as far as some of the shots you would never experience as an archer. But yeah, that's you pretty did awesome. at the event. Yeah, it was. it's really right. cool. You should come out next year, and we'll hang out, and uh, you'll just have fun, man. You'll be at a, you know, the tram takes you up to 11,000 feet, and then you get to, to basically shoot your way down the mountain. It's it's really cool. The temperatures are nicer because you're at higher elevations. Uh, you get a room. You'll have a pool. You'll have all the amenities, uh, good coffees, good food, fine dining, take your wife out, all that good stuff, and still play with your kids and have a good time. Well, for people that don't know, the budget for podcasting is absolutely ginormous. So yeah, I'm gonna yeah. yeah. I mean, so hopefully there's a pool in in my hotel room, in in my own suite, and uh, yeah, you know maybe maybe there'll be like Chris Howe, mm-hmm. you know, I'll have Anthony yeah. there, 
out. <laughs> We're just going to party. Call on the podcast. Right, right, later. right. Yeah. So, um, I've been threatening for years to get out there, and uh, next year is the year I'm going to get out there and hang out with you and shoot yep. the course and just enjoy a, a, an awesome weekend. All right. Sounds good to me. So now that uh, you're on the opposite side of the fence, Anthony, what did you uh, enjoy about it the most this year? I think just the people. I I never got to enjoy it before. So to to sit and have conversations with people, have fun, that that to me is is what it was about, you know? Yeah, I did get to shoot, um but I don't me personally, I do my shooting um up in the mountains, a place that I just call FMP. Uh, which stands for Full Moon Productions. And I just go to this place that I found with an old friend of mine up in the mountains, and we have some targets up there, and it's a long hike and grueling steep. And that's where I kind of go to shoot for my, I guess, my zen or my place where I can concentrate. When I go to events, a lot of times it's more social. Um, and, And I enjoy that part about it. It's not a bad thing, but I don't go there me personally, I don't go there to shoot. If I do that because I live here, I just go to my own shooting place I have and uh, shoot there. Yeah, that's super cool, though. So moving on, Anthony, I know that uh, it's such a weird gambit of you being there and socializing, and now you have – I'm going to mix this in here. Stay with me. But now you have this article, which I'm super proud of, and that's what I was going to bring up is we have this social kind of weird experiment in the world of hunting and bow hunting where we don't, you know, compliment each other. We're not proud of each other. It, it's always he takes, she takes. It's a, as you know, Anthony, it's a, it's a cutthroat world. But yeah, you go to, I agree. you know, total archery challenge or social line, everybody has fun. But I just wanted to say to you, congratulations on your first article in Bow Hunting World. I'm super stoked for you. I think it's outrageously good and one of the coolest articles that I've ever read. Well, thanks, dude. I appreciate that. I I'm not a I'm not a good writer. Um, I had some help uh, from the the uh, editor there, uh, Jace Bowserman, and he kind of lined me up with it, like like how to write. Um, I struggle, um, with being dyslexic. So it, no kidding me, kidding you, excuse me. I, I probably spent around 25 hours on this, which to most people, they would probably quit, but I really, I really wanted to do this and I wanted to do it right. I have written for some other people before. And um, it was good, but I don't think I tried hard enough, you know? Like, you you think you're going to write something, and then you write it, and you're like, eh, well, you know, it's good, but, eh, I don't know if it's that good. And that's not me being a critic of just myself. Um, I think just like anything, it takes time. And and by all means, I am not a, a great writer, and when you turn something in the, the managing editor or editor um, that goes through your piece, um, you know, they get to change some things around. And and sometimes uh, writers would tell you that, you know, sometimes it's for the good, sometimes it's not, or sometimes they get offended by it. I did not get offended by um, a few of the changes, uh, which there weren't many uh, because I had uh, really, really good guidance from Jace. Yeah, shout out to Jace. Uh, as you know, Jace has been on the show. He's a buddy of ours, and uh, that's a cool scenario for you, Anthony. That you, you know, you got to experience that with him, who's the, uh, you know, chief editor of Bow Hunting World magazine. Yeah, yeah, and and, and he knew um, that it was going to be tough for me. You know, I was very open about telling him, and then uh, you know, the guidelines that he had set for me. Um, 
which I can go through them real quick, uh, was an intro, um, and that was 150 words. And then you have the main body of your story, which was 1,800 words. And then I had sidebar, and the sidebar is around 300 words, and those are your products, the products that you use. And then I had the ideas. So I, I took my own notes and said, okay, you know, how did I find the spot? How did I find the feed? How did I keep my scent down? And how I got started uh, with the food, the, the blind, and drag lines and using scents. So I, I wrote these out, these categories, and I'm reading them off of what I had written down. How I used the trail cameras, uh, how I patterned the deer. And then he wanted me to go through uh, the tips. So I have written down in the number five is the tips on the area um, for someone reading. And then it was um, bullet point writing. So then I went through, and the bullet point is basically just what it sounds is, you know, when you get into your sidebars, and that's your bullet point or your ideas. And then he, you know, he just said, look, I know you're, you're very um, a technical person in the field, and I want you to get that across. So I was very, very detailed, and I, and I almost run it. Um, in Jace's words, in a in a tactical uh, method, is is how I hunt and how I um, rule out variables. So that was my my notes that some that I had written in and filled in the blanks. But that was the gist of what Jace was uh, telling me to get started. Now. Uh just so everybody knows, Anthony, this was uh, this month's Bow Hunting World magazine. It's called actually Bow Hunting Extreme on this month's uh, magazine. And your article is Whitetail Tactics for Western Muley. So, and uh, for everybody out there, it's page 116, 117 is the start of the article. So, you know, I'm looking at it now, Anthony. I know, you, like, I don't know if you call these the sidebars or basically you have like you said, bullet points of the article. So it starts with the spot, and then you have the wind. You have um, the hunt. You have camp sidebars of feeding cameras. And uh, you have all these different stuff in this article. And what it gets back to is really the, the headline of the article is whitetail tactics. So give me a little rundown on where you came up to use this idea for mule deer. Uh, it kind of happened as a mistake. I I used to always have a hunting partner, and that partner would be able to film uh, in the past. Uh, we would take turns filming each other on spot and stock hunts. Um, I lost that partner a number of years ago, and that's something that you just don't replace right away. So I, I started really looking at how was I going to film at the same time I was going to be the hunter. And I've always really, really strongly disliked when guys film themselves. I, I, I've i never enjoyed it. And so I had the, the task of how am I going to make it so it looks like, you know, I'm not filming it as much as I am. And so I came to the conclusion, I was already working with BB Square and uh, Respect the Game TV show with, with Elite Archery and the Outdoor Group. They, you know, you know still my job is to get out there and, and film hunts. So I kind of stumbled into it, but then when I got going, I really started enjoying the fact of putting in the, the long-range attractant by BB Square, and then I really got into cameras, man. I was super stoked on this information that was coming into me when I wasn't there. 
and it, you're saying it, trail it, camera. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and so these the trail cameras. I really learned like if you're not on your trail cameras, I will tell you you need to be. The trail cameras kind of kept me in the game because when they weren't in, because remember I'm learning this. I'm doing this all for the first time using trail cameras. I've used them in the past for years, but never on a week-to-week or bi-week information piece. And I noticed um, as I was having the cameras more active, um, so I would always put one. I had two feed stations uh, plus the blind. I'm not going to tell you everything I did. Just because I don't, you know, I'd like someone to, to read the magazine and see what they think, and then you know, comment on my Facebook page or yours, and, and then we'll talk about it more. But um, I really liked when I was on top of my cameras. I was more excited to be in the blind because the information was telling me that things were happening sooner. Meaning the rut was coming. I actually saw buck footage. Um, and some of those photos don't make it in the article. Um, so that that was probably the, the coolest thing. I mean, I learned I learned so much. I, I could talk for hours about it. But uh, that was something that was very exciting to me, was being able to get information on a biweekly basis that was telling me that the rut was coming just like a whitetail deer. And, and I'll tell you, there's not a lot of big differences between the two species. Not as much as a whitetail hunter would think, and not as much as a mule deer hunter would think. So I'm just curious, Anthony, just because I love, I mean, it's, my hobby within hunting is to run cameras. I love it. Okay. And, and I am super in tune, and it's a huge part of my arsenal, you know, figuring out when these bucks are showing up on scrapes or when that pre rut is about to start, just like you were just saying. So what tipped you off? What did you notice from mule, mule deer buck one or two that, hey, this is starting now and it's starting early? Well, I guess to back up, I would, I learned, I hunted whitetails for a long time in Michigan, but I was never successful with a bow. And so okay. to to go to take yourself back to a time when you watch the ground and you watch the sign very closely in the woods, that was exciting. That's what a whitetail hunter does. They pay close attention to sign. Mule deer hunter, they don't give a shit about that. They think, well, so what? It's a deer trail. Whatever. They're always uh, a lot of them are stuck in the old ways of, well, I'll just spot and stalk the way I do in August. And then they try to do the same thing September, October, and November, which those tactics rarely work for those other months. They might work in August, but they don't work normally in the rest of the year. Um, they can. They can work. I'm not going to say that they don't work, but they don't work as well the tactics in August as they do in September and October. But to take the the drag lines and using scent wicks, and, and I've seen other guys use uh, those things in the mule deer woods, but they do it in such a way that they would put the wick on themselves to mask odor which that that can work, but if you use it at the right time of the rut and understand the mule deer rut, just as one does for the whitetail rut, and they're they're exactly the same, they may start at different times, but you still have the pre-rut and then the start of the rut, then you have the middle of the rut, then you've got the end of the rut. Those are all the same. And you can get into like the chase stage, if you want to call it that, or the lockdown. Um, Those terms are very, uh, for someone that understands the rut, uh, like you do, those, if you understand those terms and you understand those times, 
um, like I did going into this mule deer hunt uh, out of a ground blind, it made it easier. So I, my cameras were telling me that I was seeing deer coming around. I saw more bucks get on their feet in late October, just like you always read about in White Hills. And then I watched the weather very closely, and the time change happened. So the time change is what dictates the doe coming into heat. And the weather helps with getting the animals on their feet and keeping them moving during the day. Um, Because as you well know, when it's warm out, they'll do a lot of their rutting activity in the evening or night. And they're not as active in the day when it's super hot. Um, So anyway, knowing the stuff that I know about whitetails from doing a lot of reading and still doing a lot of reading about it uh, to pick up new ideas and new tactics, um, that's that's just good stuff. I I just love it. I love it too. And it's funny that you mentioned the whitetail hunters and checking signs because if I was with you Anthony the first thing I would do even though it's your world out there if we're elk hunting or mule deer hunting the first thing I would be doing I would be looking at the ground I'd be looking for tracks you know I would be looking where that you know that mule deer buck took a crap I'd be looking yep. for every tr- tree it raked last year and trying to paint a picture in my head of how this works you know so that's cool right. that, uh, to hear that you're getting some of that you know, involved. I think it makes total sense. And it's surprising to me that there hasn't been more guys doing this kind of stuff. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't talk about it and I don't, I don't show any pictures of me doing that on my Facebook page because the guys around here will get, they'll get going on it. And the next thing you know, there'll be blinds everywhere and tree stands everywhere. And it'll, it'll soften the impact of what I do will would be softened, which I think if guys were really to dig deep into this, they would do more of it. I think, especially in the rut. Now, obviously, in the rut, you can't be picky about what deer you're going to kill. When the deer came in that I killed, um, I didn't hesitate at all. I was like, okay, it's a good buck. I'm shooting him. It, it took me all of three seconds from the time I first saw him. I was like, yep, shooting. I grabbed the bow, turned the camera on, and I was rolling. And that buck, I don't think he was sleeping very far from where the where the ground line was, like less than 100 yards. He had literally ran down to the BB square that I had on the ground, and I had a scent wick right above it. And he hit that scent wick with his nose and I had it, and I had it on film, and he took a big, huge whiff of that, and he was ready to go. That's it, it was. It wasn't even good. It was awesome. Like, you know, the whole time I was doing this, I, I was, you know, of course, questioning myself. When you're trying to break new ground like this, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> Do I? Am I? Am I dreaming? The, like, I'm going to pull this off. And uh, even my buddies that helped me with it, I had two very good friends that were helping me with it. And uh, one was Chris Applegate. Um, He did a little bit of filming for me on the retrieval. And then I had uh, Chris um, O'Connor was the one that helped helped me pick the location. And and, uh, they were were willing to help, but they – they more just said, all right, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to help. I mean, we're talking eight, nine hours to set a ground blind. You guys can nail this stuff down quicker, but we've got thermals that are that are blowing up and sucking down, and then we've got so much hunting pressure in this particular area of public ground where I've got, you know, over 100 people a day at that time of year glassing. And if they find your ground blind, they're just going to steal it. His folder up, take it. Yeah, I, that's the crap we got to deal with. It's horrible. So yeah, so you got to have and, that stuff hit. Right, right. So so when you're placing a blind out here, I was more worried about people 
But then I had to go into wind situations, and then I really was starting to look at the density of the of the forest that I was in, and I picked some. I wanted the most dense stuff that I could possibly find, and then I wanted people that would be traveling around, other hunters. I knew where they were going to be just in years past because of what they do. Humans are just like animals. You can pattern them. And uh, so that was that was the, the, the big task at hand was, you know, staying hidden at the same time uh, you're hunting. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I for sure see that being a, a big obstacle when you're already trying to kill a very mature deer that doesn't want to be killed at all. And, uh, and it's like a double-edged sword. You know, you're trying to ex- escape in and out in your gear without being seen by other guys that are potentially hunting the same area. So that it makes for some pretty tense moments. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't even, uh, when I would go in and out, um, I wouldn't use a headlamp. Because if I was in, afraid of someone else seeing me, or maybe they decided to walk down a certain ridge that led, you know, a ridge that I would come out on. And if I ran into them, then there's a conversation. And I and I I was clearly not looking with a pair of big white tail boots that I wear, um, and being dry, you know, because I wasn't getting wet because I was in an environment, a controlled environment, sitting in a blind. Um, yeah, it 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 was interesting. Hey, I didn't mind rolling without a light. I don't really care. Um, but but that was just a, one other way that I had to basically stay um, out of the out of uh, harm's way. Well, I know that eventually it, it ended really well for you. So congratulations. I mean, like a smoking great deer, probably. I mean, he's right up there with your your best mule deer ever. And you did it in a totally different fashion, which I, I think is probably uh, means a lot to you, actually, when you think of all the good deer you've killed. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, it's I think it'd be good for anybody, you know, um, to to change what they do and really step outside of their comfort zone and try something new is is I think it's exciting and it and it always adds a new spin to hunting. So, uh, you know, I, I always strongly suggest there's. Um, I've always told people, they say, well, how'd you kill that deer? And I, or there's, you know, what's your, they, people think that there's one way. They want to be good at one way how to kill a deer. And I tell people when they ask me that question, I say there's, there's quite a few different, and I call them styles. There's quite, a, there's quite a few different ways to, to, uh, or styles to kill a deer. And when you tell someone that, I'm not sure if they understand me. Um, my point to that is, is, don't get caught in trying to kill a deer the same way. If it requires a ground line because there's a there's a there's a time when you strike the target, you want to strike the target at its weakest point. And figuring out what that weakest point is is always the task at hand. So whatever method gets you to that point, that's the right one. Yeah, that's super well said. And, uh, you know, it's always good to keep that mindset open like that. And as you know and I know, Anthony, there's a lot of guys that don't. So important for us anyways because I want to be successful, and I know you do. And, uh, you know, it's funny when I talk to guys, and you've heard it too, you know, there's only one way to do stuff or that way, and then they question how you're killing deer. Well, we're killing them because we're constantly working and evolving at that. And once you stop evolving, it's kind of over. You get stagnant and you're just algae on top of the water. That's not floating anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. So two things, you know, to take away from Anthony, uh, you know, for this is, is don't stop, you know, trying new things. And if you run into Anthony in the dark on the side of a mountain, do not have have a conversation with them. 
Yeah, sometimes I have a I have a tendency to talk too much, which uh is to my fault for sure. So with that being said though, Anthony, thanks so much for being on the show today. Everybody check out Bow Hunting World Extreme magazine this month. Read Anthony's article and, and reach out and ask questions if you guys got it. And uh Anthony, you got anything uh coming up next week or two we need to know about? Um, I'll be in the field quite a bit more. Um, I've been running an e-bike lately, so if you want to get together and talk about that, I will have more information. I'm uh, definitely embarking on this, and I'm all in as far as owning the bike and what it is doing for me. And uh, if you want, uh, we'll do another episode on it. It's fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, coming up more and more. Even, uh, you know, a guy around the Midwest here that uh, has his own podcast and TV show is starting to run an e-bike for taking decoys out and setting up cameras. So I definitely want to know, you know, what you're going to say and and how you dissect it. So if if you give me the word it's to go, I want to hear it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it next week. All right. Well, everybody, that's it. And as you know, you guys can find Taking Every Tuesday live on iTunes, Outdoor Podcast Channel, Podros, and see you guys.